Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm trying. Uh, can you see? Uh, okay, great. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, it's clear. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this is, um, so let me start. Uh, first, thanks, uh, Parin, for uh, organizing this webinar. Um, this is the second one. Uh, many of you may have missed the first one, where we defined the uh, foundations for um, the foundations for the uh, hyperconvex metric spaces okay and uh, we do have uh, a recording that i'm sorry anyone wants to see the details uh we do have that okay so um let's um let me start first by uh, uh recalling some of the basic facts okay uh the uh, Uh, so we have uh, the concept of uh, hyperconvexity or injectivity. Uh, it, it's it's an old concept. Uh, uh, I always have problem. I'll be honest with you. Which one is older? Is it Arrangian and Panishpati? I think that Panishpati is a student, and Arrangian is the is the advisor. And I know that the advisor. Let me say, say it this way: the advisor. Um, did uh, start these ideas uh, very, very early on uh, of the 1900s, okay? Um, so, uh, when he had his student, when he asked him in his PhD some of the questions, uh, some of these questions, the, uh, uh, the first initial ones, were already done by the advisor. Okay. And the idea was, um, basically, uh, basically without going into details, is the uh, validity of the Anbanach theorem uh, in metric spaces. This is the idea. Okay, So we have the Anbanach theorem in Bach spaces, uh, where you have some kind of extension of the, uh, of the uh, linear functionals, continuous linear functionals, uh, and preserving the norm, of course, of the functional uh, to consider the case of uh, because, I mean, when you have a, a, a linear functional uh, with certain norm, it's not just continuous, it's also uniformly continuous. In fact, it's Lipschitzian. And the concept of Lipschitz is exactly the norm of the linear functional. So, what you do, you go to metric spaces and instead of considering the the, the class or the family of continuous functions, you consider, of course, the case of, uh, of uh, uh, Lipschitzian mappings, okay? And what you want is to have a, some kind of extension of uh, Lipschitzian mappings and preserving the uh, constant of Lipschitz. This is in a simple way, but uh, what, what, what they did, they did uh, this is the beginning, of course, how it started. But then, of course, they looked at the case of it's the same extension as if you consider what we call the modulus of continuity of uniform continuous functions. This is the idea. And they characterize these metric spaces uh, in, in the PhD work uh, as being what's known as absolute non expensive retracts. Okay, absolute non expensive Okay. A and R. Okay. So uh, people who are uh, familiar in topology, they know that uh, they have something called uh, uh, it is known as uh, 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 AR, absolute retract. So you have absolute non-expensive retract, but there is a, a concept in topology known as absolute retract, okay? And it's the same idea, but except that instead of looking at uh, Lipschitz mappings with constant one or retract with constant one, you have uh, continuous retract. Huh? Okay, so anyway, uh, uh, in that talk, in the first talk, we talked about the, the basics, 
okay? The basics. In the second talk, uh, I will go a little bit more in details and some amazing facts about these metric spaces. Um, so, first, uh, let us discuss some of the properties. Uh, so, again, as I said, uh, So here is the definition, sorry, I should have given you this definition. So this is the definition of what's known as metric spaces. So this is the concept of metric spaces, okay, which are hyperconvex. So what do we have? We have a collection of balls, as you can see here, so collection of balls, and we are concerned about the intersection of this collection of balls. So it's an intersection property, basically. Okay? So, I put in a simple way, um, so what we have is uh, a collection of balls that intersect two by two. Two by two. Okay? And uh, we want to conclude that the total intersection is uh, not empty. That's what we want, okay? So, uh, as you can see, we have this condition here, okay? This condition, in fact, this condition, it just tells us that the uh, two moles, in other words, B, X alpha, R alpha, and B, X beta, R beta, do not intersect. If they do not intersect by the triangular inequality, we have this condition, okay? On the centers and the radiuses, okay? So, so, uh, so again, again, what did I say? I said, uh, what is hyperconvexity? At least in the linear case, it means that you have a collection of balls which intersect two by two, then they intersect totally. Huh? All of them will intersect. Okay? This is really amazing. So, uh, clearly, uh, if you have uh, a collection of balls which intersect finitely, they will intersect two by two. Okay, so, uh, uh, but the, the converse is not true. Uh, you may have uh, a family of uh, uh, balls which uh, intersect two by two, but they don't intersect finitely. Like, for example, uh, let me see here. Uh, let me bring, one second, huh? let me bring something to work with. Okay, so for example, if you take uh, this ball, this ball, and this ball, okay, in the Hilbert, huh? R2. So you can see that uh, these three balls, they intersect two by two, but the total intersection is empty, okay? And there are only three. So it's not, it's not equivalent that they intersect two by two or they intersect finitely, huh? okay? So we have uh, here, uh, it's two by two, huh? okay? So uh, the question becomes, when do we have this condition on the centers is exactly the same as saying that the two balls intersect, okay? And so when? And that's what you have here, okay? It's called metric convexity, basically. Huh? So, you see, the, the, if you take two balls and the distance between the centers is less than R1 plus R2, then they intersect. This is equivalent to what's known as the metric what? Convexity, okay? Huh? Uh, the concept of convexity in metric spaces is it's an amazing one that took some... some uh, people, I mean, the, the people are interested now. Uh, many people are interested uh, into this. Anyway, so uh, let's uh, let's uh, continue. Okay, so if you take R, uh, the real line, it is hyperconvex. But if you take the Euclidean plane R2, it's not hyperconvex, okay? Uh, 
But as we said, uh, it, it, this condition here, okay, implies the ball is not empty from what I just said before. It means that it's metrically convex, okay, metrically convex. And when you have this intersection of balls property, okay, then it's not very hard to prove that, in fact, it is complete. Huh? So the metric space. So a hyperconvex metric space is complete. Okay? Great. Next. Um, so, as we said, it's an extension property for Lipschitz mapping. So what is a Lipschitz mapping? Uh, traditional definition. Okay? And when the constant k is equal to 1, we have what's known as non-expensive mapping, okay? Uh, the concept of fixed point is well known, okay? And the fixed point set uh, for me from now on will be denoted by fix of t, okay? Of course, if you have fixed point, it means that m1 and m2 are the same nature. You cannot have a common point in the, uh, in the uh, domain at the range if the two are different, okay? And in general, I will assume, I'm honest with you, uh, and I will always assume when it comes to the fixed point problem, I will assume that M1 is the same as M2. Okay, I will not bother with the, uh, the case of... Uh... Okay. So, uh, so what does that mean to be injective? Okay, a metric space is injective if you have this uh, uh, extension property uh, uh, there, from non-expensive to non-expensive. So what, what does that mean? Let me show it to you on... Uh, uh, so we have uh, Y, okay? And we have F. F is non-expensive. Okay? And then uh, we have... X, which is bigger than Y, okay? So Y is a, a subset of, uh, as a subset of, uh, so now you can find an extension yeah, uh, of F, which is also non-expensive. Okay, so remember, uh, an extension means that when you restrict the bigger one uh, to the smaller one, you end up having F. So this is known as uh, injective metric space, huh? an injective metric space. And remember, I told you that it is connected to the concept of uh, to the concept of uh, to the concept of hyperconvexity. Uh, if we go back to the original work of uh, uh, Rangin and Banach, okay, and, and of course the, uh, the the case of linear Banach spaces, injective linear Banach space, is well known. Okay, uh, fully. Uh, uh, Determined. So clearly, the class of linear functions in the Anbanach theorem, blah blah blah. This is exactly what I was telling you about uh, the Anbanach theorem. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, uh, if we go back to what I, I said earlier, hyperconvexity and the injectivity are the same. Okay? It's if and only if. Huh? Okay. So uh, again. Let me explain this one in a different way. We have seen this uh, in our first talk. So if you take now H, which is hyperconvex, yeah? And uh, let's take uh, H into H, and you take here the identity map. So clearly, the identity map is an isometry, and therefore it is non-expensive. Okay, and now you go and you look at any uh, metric space which contains H. Then, from what we just said earlier, you can find R, which is non-expensive, uh, from M into H. 
okay? Because it's the target set, it's the target set that should be hypercolonized, huh? mm -hmm. which by the way, that's what happened in the case of Anbanach, because we go into R, okay? And we just say that R, uh, endowed with the absolute value, is a hyperconvex matrix space. And uh, what are the properties of this R, okay? So R goes from M into H. But what's interesting is that when you take R restricted to H, because H is the subset of M, is the identity. Okay? So what does that mean? It means that R of X is equal to X if X belongs to H, because it's the identity. Okay? Moreover, what happened to R of R of X for any X in the metric space? Okay? In the big one, huh? So we have R of R of X, and R of X belongs to H, but we just said that R restricted to H is the identity, therefore this is just what? R of X. This is exactly in the linear case, uh, in the linear case, what's known as projection. Okay? Okay? It's a projection. But in the, in the nonlinear case, we will use the word retract. So these two properties define, define what's known as a retract. Huh? So we go from the big one to the smaller one. And um, the concept of retract, uh, which is originally in the, uh, was defined and uh, studied in the linear case, found some very amazing applications when uh, 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 it was used in the discrete math. Okay, so for example, when you take uh, a partially ordered set or a graph and you use some of the properties of retract, then uh, you can uh, have to say something about the big graph if you know something about the small graph. Okay, so for example, the concept of holes, the concept of what's known tractable, the tractability in graph theory, etc., etc., or for example, fixed point property for edge preserving mappings. Okay, so uh, if you can. Uh, keep retracting and the smaller one has the fixed point property for edge preserving mappings and the big one has the fixed point property for we'll see something similar in the last talk huh? in the last talk huh? but anyway so the concept of retract is really nice what's, what's new here in the case of hyperconvex is the fact that it is non-expensive R is non-expensive okay in the absolute retract and that's why we call them absolute non-expensive Retract. But in the case of absolute retract, the R is only assumed to be continuous. It's only assumed. AR, I'm talking about. Absolute retract. Okay. So th this is what I was explaining uh, right now. So we have the following beautiful result, which is what? That if you take a hyperconvex metric space, then you have this. Uh, absolute non-expensive retract property, and what's amazing is um, it doesn't look here. We don't see it, but so what did we say? We said uh, basically that if you take any, uh, uh, you know what? I need to find the different colors. Where are the colors? Hold on one second. Uh, uh, row. Okay. Okay, so uh, if you take uh, if you take the, the big one, huh? the big one, yes. So the absolute non-expensive retract says that whenever you have uh, a bigger set M, then you have this extension, huh? this non-expensive retract from N into H. What's amazing is. Uh, uh, it's something that uh, I found when I was do when I started working on these problems 30 years ago. That I don't need to extend to any big set. I just need to add one point. So if you take one point outside of H, then I can find here omega union H. That's what I need. See one point, not a bigger set, huh? just if I am able to extend to one point, then we have this amazing property, okay? And this, I called it one local retract. One local retract. It's a concept that I defined 
Um, okay, so that's what you have here uh, in the third property. I'm just extending one point, okay? And um, if I'm able to find a non-expensive retract, then we have uh, this concept of hyperconvexity, huh? okay? Those properties known as one local retract property, okay? Anyway, so uh, let's continue. Uh, here, what do we have? We have the following result, that if H is a hyperconvex metric space, and uh, you have uh, a non-expensive retract, then the image uh, is hyperconvex. So uh, let, let me explain this. It's really sometimes dry when you look at the theorems, and they don't, you don't capture them. See what I mean? Uh, this is a formal way of writing something. But what does it say? What does that mean? Okay? It says the following. That, okay, so we have uh, H. Let me start with, we have H. And we have H0 inside. Okay? First. Okay? And we assume that H is hyperconvex. So basically, H0 is a subset of a hyperconvex metric space. Okay, great. So now, assume that you have, this is H, and this is H0. And you have now R, which is a non-expensive retract. So basically, you have a projection from H into H0. Like the case of Hilbert space, if you take any closed convex subset, we do have a projection, huh? the nearest distance, a projection from the Hilbert space to the convex set. And uh, in fact, uh, in the case of Hilbert, of course, that uh, projection is non-expensive, uh, is non-expensive, okay? Be careful, I mean, we already said that uh, Hilbert's Euclidean structure is not hyperbolic. It's a, a weird concept. I mean, not that weird, but different. Huh? You will see more when I when I get a little bit farther in the top. So, if that's the case, if you have this, then this one is also hyperconvex. Okay? It's also hyperconvex. So, uh, how, how, how can we see this? It's very, very simple, by the way. Uh, so, uh, let's say you have a, a collection of balls. Yeah? Where? In, uh, in H0. Yeah? And we assume that the distance from x alpha to x beta is less than r alpha plus r beta. Okay? And you want to show now, is this true? This is the question, that the intersections of all these balls is not empty. Yeah, that's the question. Uh, we'll go back to the definition of hyperconvexity. What's interesting is that, uh, uh, first of all, what do I mean by uh, in? Uh, what do I mean by in H0? I mean that the centers are in H0, and the centers of the ball. Okay? Great. So, uh, uh, now, uh, what do we know? We know that H is hyperconvex, and we know that these balls can also be seen as balls in H, in the big space, okay? They become bigger, of course, huh? Uh, they become bigger. Huh? It's like looking at R3 and the hyperplane, huh? The hyperplane, huh? In R3. So, uh, the balls in the hyperplane are flat, while the balls uh, uh, in uh, the R3 in the, are balls, really like basketballs, okay? But the other ones are flat. Okay, so... Uh, if I look at these balls now in H, then the intersection is not empty. Why? Because I said that it's hyperconvex. Yes? So now, let's take an omega there. But this omega may not be in H0. What's interesting is that R of omega belongs to, because R is non-expensive, huh? So it belongs to the intersection of R of X alpha, R alpha. Okay? That 
because R is non-expensive. It preserves the radius. Yes? But then we know that R of X alpha, R of X alpha, is equal to X alpha Y because R is a retract. Yeah? And therefore, R of omega, which belongs to H, also belongs to the intersection of the balls X alpha, R alpha, as well as H0, because R goes into H0. So you see, it's not empty. Basically, it's not empty. And therefore, H0 is uh, hyperconvex. Keep in mind that H0 is exactly R of H, which is also exactly the fixed point set of R. So uh, when you have a retract, when you have a non-expensive retract, the image which is the set of fixed point of the retract, is hyperbolic. Uh, this is a really interesting. Uh, I'm getting you uh, somewhere here, okay? Hmm? Okay, so that's what you have here. Um, uh, now, keep in mind that the intersection of balls in a hyperconvex metric space is hyperconvex. Okay, what do I want to say by this? Now, uh, something else. So, I'm just giving you some examples. Uh, now, I'm getting to the structure of hyperconvex metric spaces, okay? So here, uh, let's assume that H is hyperconvex. And let's take uh, a collection of balls, okay? Okay, alpha. And assume that the intersection is not empty, okay? Okay. Great. So we're going to use this a lot. Huh? So that's why I want to, 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 to emphasize this. So intersection of balls. Huh? This is a family of intersection of balls. Um, and it's not empty. So obviously it's rounded because it's included in a ball, in any, any of the balls there. And uh, what's interesting about uh, A, A is hyperconvex. Wow. This is really amazing. Okay. So the intersection of balls in hyperconvex is hyperconvex. Why? Because I mean, as, you, as you can see, if you take now a, a, a family of balls centered in A, put all these balls together, and you can see that they intersect two by two, and therefore they intersect totally because the, uh, the H is hyperconvex. That's the idea. Whenever you have uh, sets which are intersectional balls, and you want to take a new collection of balls centered in uh Center, excuse me, can you give me a second? Give me a second, guys, just a second, please. Okay, so uh, here, so uh, whenever we have this, this is uh, the idea, is to put all these balls together and uh, see them as hyperconvex and intersect and so on and so forth. Now remember that in the case of a hyperconvex, a big hyperconvex, uh, we have this metric convexity and therefore a collection of balls intersect totally if they intersect two by two. And it's really, that's what it means, basically. Yeah? In a simple way, huh? in a simple way. Yeah? We have to be careful about that metric convexity otherwise, okay? But once you have it, you don't have to worry about it, okay? Okay, so intersection of balls are... So let me give you uh, uh, other examples, okay? Other examples where uh, we have more hyperconvex as uh, metric spaces. The idea is what's known as uh, uh, the uh, soup, uh, the soup, uh, the soup norm. Okay, so you take a, a bunch of metric spaces and you take their Cartesian product and you take the soup 
uh, distance, okay, of all these distances, uh, as you can see it there. Uh, if, if you worry about omega i, it's only because I don't want to have uh, an extended distance, meaning that the slope can be equal to infinity, okay? So I'm putting this condition is just to avoid that, okay? Uh, so we have this d infinity distance, the classical one, the soup, and then we have this space, uh, which is the Cartesian product h. This is the Cartesian product, okay, of the h i's, and uh, endowed with this uh, uh, d infinity, and it is hyperconvex, okay? It is hyperconvex. What's amazing is uh, truly amazing. I, I can prove it using a and r because the uh, we can show that this space is ANR, so absolute non-expensive retry. But no, th there is a, pro a structural property here that is still uh, um, escaping many of us. Uh, and you will see at the end, when I get to the, to the end, that there are some amazing open problems. Uh, and uh, many people are not looking into this at all. With many applications, it's a very interesting area, but it's a hard area. Okay, so anyway, this, the idea here is that the Cartesian product, a ball in H, is in fact, so let me explain it here, I want to explain it here, okay? So we have what? We have, uh, 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 forget about that problem of uh, extended distance, huh? uh, we can be precise and it's not really a problem. So we have these HIs, I take the product of these HIs, I call it H, and I take D infinity, which is the soup of the DIs. Okay, that's basically what the idea is. Okay, so what, what's amazing is that if you take a ball, okay, in H, okay, PH, uh, with R, yes? So, uh, this X, in fact, is a certain family of XIs, Okay? And what's interesting is that this is the product of balls. So the, 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 uh, the, any ball in the Cartesian product is in fact uh, uh, a Cartesian product of ball. This is not true if you take the Euclidean distance. Do you understand? This is absolutely not true. Okay? Why? Because if you look at, for example, R2, look at R2. Okay? So if you take here this and this, this and this, these are balls in R. The Cartesian product, the Cartesian product is not the circle, do you understand? Which is the ball in uh, R2. So so this this property is is it's unique. In the case of soup norm, huh? uh, a ball is the Cartesian product of balls. And therefore, if these balls they enjoy some kind of nice behavior, nice property, like the intersection property, in the each component space HI, you have it in the big space. It's, it's really amazing property here. Amazing. Okay? It happens for the soup norm. Huh? For the soup norm. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, this problem I just mentioned here is also a problem when uh, some of the most beautiful open problems in fixed point theory, whether in discrete or in uh, metric, huh? uh, in bar spaces, of course, which is what's known as the product fixed point property, which is you have two spaces, X and Y, okay, X and Y, and they have the fixed point property, okay, the classical fixed point property, of course, Titian product, and it's not clear whether this one has the fixed point property, okay? And why? Because when I take C, which is convex, in the Cartesian product, uh, I, I can come up with Cx, I can come up with the projection Cy, the first component, but you see, uh, what is this compared to this? Uh, you see what I'm talking about? Because of this problem. So that's why we don't know. We need some strong geometric properties on uh, one of them to be able to, to to show that this Cartesian product, I worked on this problem, it's still open by the way, this problem. It's, uh, it's still an open. And it's the same in discrete sets. Huh? When you take now, of course, uh, for uh, uh, monotone or order preserving mappings, huh? the fixed point property becomes uh, for, uh, the, for the class of uh, 
uh, order preserving mappings. It's the same problem. It's called the products problem. Huh? It's an open problem. Anyway, so uh, let's continue. So we we know now uh, we know now what to do. Huh? So we have what we have R with the absolute value. Yeah, and from there I can get you L infinity with the soup norm. Okay, and what's interesting is, of course, here in infinity is just countably many copies of R, but in fact, I don't need, I can I have any index set, and that's what I put in there. Yes or no? Okay, and also we have the space in infinity here as well. Okay, so these two are hyperconvex. In fact, they are the only ones in the linear case, okay? They characterize, uh, in the linear case, in Banach spaces, uh, we, we know that the only injective Banach spaces are these two, okay? Anyway, uh, of course, uh, be careful, because if you take a uh, special K, and you take continuous compact set, huh? okay? And you take continuous functions on compact set, in fact, it's just like this one, and therefore, this one is uh, hyperconvex huh? when k is a special compact set. Huh? So uh, later on, when I talk about sine and swordy, sine he works into here, which by the way is the same as this. So sine works in this one, and swordy works in this one. So, but they are all working in what's known as injective Banach spaces. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go back here. Uh, that's what I was just telling you about it. That's what I was talking about, sine and swordy here, okay? Uh, and if you are wondering why I'm talking about these hyperconvex metric spaces, it's because uh, when, I, when I was doing my PhD in 1985, 6, 7, uh, Kirk is the one. So these two, these two papers appeared in 1979. I, I don't want to uh, tell you more about this because remember what I talked to, to you about one time, this issue of uh, Caristi fixed point theorem and Eklund variation problem. Okay? Mm -hmm. And remember that uh, I mentioned that Eklund was my advisor uh, in the master thesis and uh, uh, I have huge respect for him, but there is a problem. There is really a problem with that uh, issue of Caristi fixed point theorem and Eklund variation problems. I don't want to talk about this now uh, because we are talking about hyperconvexity. But what happened is there is a similar story. Okay, there is a similar story uh, between sine and sword. Okay, similar story. Uh, many of you don't know that uh, uh, I spent about uh, ten months with sine. I visited him in Rhode Island and I spent some time with him. So this time the news came from sine. Uh, Kirk said something else. Uh, about Suwardi, because he's a friend to Suwardi anyway. But anyway, what Kirk was amazing is that in that paper of 1979, uh, these are two uh, fixed point uh, papers, okay? Uh, and what happened is that Kirk is the one, not in this paper, not in this paper, uh, he noticed that in fact both theorems uh, are the result of his classical fixed point theorem of 1965 in hyperconvex matrix spaces. So basically, Kirk is the one who noticed this, what you see here. Okay? The, un the underlying setting for both sine and sorority fixed point theorem is hyperconvexity, hyperconvex matrix spaces. Okay? But in order to understand that, so uh, let me uh, continue. This is what, what I'm saying right here. Okay? Uh, let me give you another example, beautiful example of uh, hyperconvex matrix spaces. Okay, uh, the other example is what's known as uh, cat kappa spaces. Cat kappa spaces. This is nice and dear to uh, Parin, uh, to Parin, and specifically maybe his student was going to be working on these issues as well. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, this kappa is the curvature. Huh? So, I mean, you look at these cut kappa spaces as surfaces, okay? So, we have 
uh, a ball. Let's take a ball. Okay? And either you do a geometry inside, so let me take some different colors. Either you are looking inside or you are looking outside. So you have two cases. Either you do a geometry inside the ball, uh, like for example, some particle, I'm sorry, some uh, marbles uh, that are moving around inside the ball, or you reverse the ball, right? You reverse it like this. Like the surface of the earth, and you, you play here, so it's the same, okay? And so now you are on the top. So w when you do that, uh, like for example, what's happening with the earth, uh, all our geometry is on the surface of the earth, which is like the green one. And what happened here is that uh, this issue of uh, if you take any uh, triangle, huh? any triangle, in the case of R2, for example. Somebody is asking for something? What? Sorry. So, if you look at the flat one, if you look at the flat one, you will see that the sum of the angles, the flat one, huh? the Euclidean geometry, huh? the Euclidean geometry. So, the, the, the flat one, it gives you pi, or 180 degrees. Okay? Great. What happens when you are uh, uh, with a positive curvature or negative curvature? Okay, so this is positive curvature, kappa is positive, while inside here is negative. So, in the negative case, uh, in the negative case, it looks like this. And in the positive case, it looks like this. So, the angles here, if you add them, you have something bigger than 180 degrees. While here, if you add them, you get something less. It depends on the curvature, of course. Huh? It becomes less than 180 degrees. So if we look at now cat kappa with kappa negative, okay, you have an amazing book published by Springer uh, on... Uh, metric spaces with negative curvatures, huh? these cut kappa spaces. I, 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 uh, that's not good. In fact, all of them are what's known as cut zero spaces. Okay, all of them. Okay, because uh, if you are a cut kappa and you take a bigger kappa, then you are okay. You are a subset of the same family. Okay, so uh, Hilbert spaces are one of them. Hilbert are cut zero, but they are not cut kappa for kappa negative, okay? So, what happens if uh, we are cut kappa for any kappa negative, okay? So, we are like this, like this picture, for any here, this one here, for any kappa. So, as you can see, these triangles, they become like this, huh? more and more, depending on the curvature, to a point where the triangle becomes like this. See? Thin, like straight. So we call them cut minus infinity. Okay? You are cut minus infinity. Okay? So these examples, these examples, in fact, are what's known as matrix trees. Okay? Like tree with branches. So it's known as metric trees. So the metric tree can have root, okay? Or may not have root. You go all the way down to infinity. It doesn't have a... And an example of this, an example of this, is what's known as the... The um, is known as the uh, 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 SNCF distance. So, if you are wondering what is this SNCF, this is the French Railroad, huh? Société Nationale de Chemin de Fer, huh? which means uh, basically, let me just give you a simple. So, this is 
the, the root is Paris. Okay? And you take any city, north, south, whatever. So, uh, east and west. Okay? East and west. So, what happened? If you want to go from A to B, okay? If B or C, if you want, is on your path, then basically the distance that you are traveling in train is only from A to C directly, the normal distance. Okay? Great. But what happens if C is not in between, which is the case of B here now? Okay? Then, in this case, you have to go to A, to Paris, and then from Paris to B. And the same if you want to go here, for example. You have to go to Paris, and then from Paris to B. Okay? So this is what's known as a beautiful example of a metric tree, and uh, with some major applications, of course, huh? the geometry and so on. So I don't wanna. Uh, that's not the talk today. It's just an example huh? of. Uh, so metric trees are hyperconvex, huh? and if you go back to look at this paper, okay, by Kirk in 1998, where he discussed this uh, uh, art trees, and uh, let me just tell you something about uh, uh, art. Kirk is that. Um, his early research prior to 1965 was in geometry. And uh, in the late 90s, he went back to geometry. Okay? He went back. He did a lot of work on cut spaces. On cut spaces. Uh, um, of course, he kept an eye on fixed point theory, but he, he wanted to do something at the end of his career on geometry. So he went back to uh, this example I'm talking about, and he... Notice that in fact our trees are hyperconvex, okay? Are hyperconvex, and they have some amazing properties, okay? Anyway, so uh, now, uh, oh, 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 this, this is this is this is amazing. Uh, so uh, let me explain to you here because you will not see it if uh, I put it in this way. Huh? So let me show you what am I talking about. So let's take uh, R two with the soup norm. So this is R two with the soup norm. So what is now the unit disk? The unit disk is going to be this one, is the square. OK? And let's look at now, uh, we said what well, balls and intersectional balls are hyperconvex. R2 is hyperconvex. So let's look at now, I want to show you this. Pay attention. Huh? Look at this. This one here. Okay. So this set is the H1, I believe, if I'm not wrong. Hold on one second. See, H1 and H2. Okay, I think it's H1, huh? Uh, one minus this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, I'm claiming that this is hyperconvex. The red one is hyperconvex. And the reason is, uh, the way we are going to do it is, so let's me. Uh, so you take any point and you go like this. Okay? So this map, I did the calculation. If you want, I can show you. But this map R, so this is R going from the unit ball, centered in zero with radius one, into H1, which is the red one. Huh? This is non-expensive ray track. It's a projection, non-expensive ray track. Okay? We have a, I have an explicit formula for, for it, and uh, this R is uh, non-expensive ray track. The ray track is easy. Huh? Once you, uh, you go in, that's it. Uh, the next one will be the identity, huh? On, from H1 to H1 is the identity. Okay, so being non-expensive retract, from what we said before, this shows that uh, R of the unit ball, which is H1, which is the fixed point set of R, is hyperconvex. Okay, so that H1 is hyperconvex. Okay, so now... Uh, similarly, so let me, similar, exactly same idea, 
Let's do the following now, okay? Again, let's go to R2. And let's take the unit ball. And let's take now H1 and H2. So this is H1. And this is H2. So this is H1. And this is H2. So H1 and H2 are both hyperconvex. Okay? Are both hyperconvex. Same idea. The projection on H2 is similar to that one, but it goes to the left. So what is the intersection of H1 intersect H2? We have this point and this point, meaning the point 0, 1, 0, minus 1. Two points. So wait a minute, wait a minute. H1 is hyperconvex. H2 is hyperconvex. The intersection are two points, but I already told you that hyperconvex are convex, are metrically convex. So what would be the middle point? If you take this two point, what would be the middle point? Of course, if you are looking in H1, ah, some of you will say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is the middle point? Okay, so if I look at them along H1, this is the middle point. And on the other side is the other point, minus one zero. Do you understand? On H1. But if you take just the two of them, what is the middle point? There's no middle point. Right? It's totally, I mean, it's disconnected. And hyperconvex are connected, okay, by this metric convexity property. Okay. So there is a path, in other words, between any two points. But here you don't have it. And therefore, it's not hyperconvex. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean? So the intersection of two hyperconvex may not be hyperconvex. This is really bad. Meaning that the fundamental property of uh, the, the fundamental property of the intersection of two convex sets, it's not. In this case, it's not. Meaning what? Meaning that hyperconvexity and convexity are totally different. Totally different. Okay? Ah. Now. Uh, some of you may, may look at this as being what? A weak concept. This hyperconvexity is a weak concept. Anyway, uh, as I said before, uh, uh, you have these uh, uh, graphs that are uh, hyperconvex, and uh, a lot we don't know yet about this with some major applications. But in any case, what happened? So this got Bayon's attention. It was uh, uh, I worked with him in my PhD uh, in the 80s. In fact, he's the one who initiated me to uh, work on hyperconvexity, okay? He was working on it, and he started asking me questions, okay? And that's how I got initiated to, to hyperconvex. In fact, this example, okay, that you see here is his example, okay? It's his example. Anyway, so uh, what's interesting is that uh, is it time to stop, Perrin? It's up to you. You let me know. Whenever, whenever it's uh, time, you just let me know. I mean, send me a, uh, in the chat room, you can send me a chat if you want. It's up to you, it's up to you. Do you want me to stop in five minutes, ten minutes, five minutes? Okay, let me just uh, a few and uh, I will stop there, okay? Hmm? So, uh, as I said now, uh, let, let, let me show you an example of how bad this is getting, okay? So, let's take set A uh, of... Uh, hyperconvex. Okay? And let's look at the case of A in a Banach space. So, when we take the intersection 
of all the convex sets. C convex uh, that contains A. What do you get? The intersection of all convex sets which contains A, we get what's known as the convex hall. Yes? So this here we grew up with. The convex hall, especially if they are closed, then you can have closure like this. But the problem is uh, this cannot be used in hyperconvex metric spaces because of the lack of the intersection of two hyperconvex is hyperconvex. Okay, so uh, what do we know about uh, hyperconvexity and intersection of hyperconvex matrix space? Uh, this is uh, the most uh, puzzling, amazing result known in the theory of hyperconvex matrix spaces. It was proved by Bayon, okay? And what he showed is this uh, beautiful result, which says that <clears throat> if you have a collection of hyperconvex matrix spaces, but they're directed uh, downward, huh? so they are like decreasing, getting smaller and smaller, okay? Then the intersection is not empty and is hyperconvex. So you don't have it for just plain intersection, but you do have it if they are downward directed, going down, okay? Uh, and this result uh, uh, inspired me to uh, come up with this concept of one local retract, okay? Uh, when I was working with him, by the way. And also, uh, let me just give you an open problem, okay? This result, till today, we have no clue how to do it in a simple way. The original proof by Bayon is very complicated and not even natural. Uh, it's very hard to, to grasp it. So this, we are still waiting on someone to come and give us a simple proof of this fact. Okay? So uh, let me... Uh, so... Uh, let, let me stop here. Let me stop here. Uh, yeah, let me stop here because uh, what comes next is, is interesting because it's known as the uh, work of Isbell or the inject uh, in the injective envelope or the hyperconvex envelope of a set. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it another time. Okay, so uh, it's, there is still uh, a lot more to say. We're almost at the end, but we, we still have a lot to say. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll do that next time. Any questions? Hello, Doctor. Uh, yes. Can you hear yes, me? Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Parin. We did not hear you well before. Okay, all right. so sorry, I was on another laptop, now I'm switching to another one. Uh, you, you are planning to give one talk today, right? Not two, because you sent me two slides. Right, right, right. Uh, that is the major second talk, the third one on uh, fixed point theory in this case, which, by the way, there are some beautiful open problems, uh, which can be of interest to the people working in our area, yeah. But again, uh, already uh, the, the geometry of hyperconvex metric spaces is still unknown. In other words, we still have a lot of open questions. It's interesting. Okay? Yeah. So then uh, the third talk will follow on another day or right right now after a break. Yeah, no, 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 not right now. No, no, no. Okay, so another day we will continue on the third part. Wonderful. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, so, first of all, I have to thank you very much for your nice and clear talk and for your contribution on our group at the MUTT. Thank you so much. Oh, you are welcome, my friend. No, you are welcome. Anytime, of course. What do you mean? Uh, let me... I want to do something here. 